I just try to stay grateful for all of it, that I'm still here to, to live this wonderful adventure. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, founder and podcast producer of Max Podcasting. And you can email me at max at maxpodcasting.com to save time with your high-quality podcast. This is episode 227. I don't know why I pronounce it so slowly. And today's guest is Tiffany Crewmans. Tiffany is one of the most inspiring people you will ever hear from, and I don't want to give away too much, but she has been called by the Huffington Post as a modern-day Mary Poppins. She is the founder of Ava the Elephant, as well as Opu Probiotics, and conquered a ton in her personal life, and she was on the first-ever episode of Shark Tank, episode number one, the pilot. In this episode, we talked all those things, how they happen, how Tiffany continues to be so strong and her mission and everything she does, and something she can do with her toes, because why not? <laughs> it is the Crewman Zader, uh, Tiffany. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with... Tiffany Crewman's a serial entrepreneur, inventor, a very, very um, special place in the first ever episode of Shark Tank. We might talk about that a little bit. But to start off, so shout out to our mutual friend, Kevin Lane from Create a Castle, and, and now who's been on Shark Tank, as, as we were chatting about. He has been so over-the-top generous and, and kind and just referring... Uh, amazing, you know, Shark Tank alums and entrepreneurs my way, you know, for this podcast. Um, so you're, of course, one of them. That's that's how we connected. So many different stories can come out of it. But I think you have a an extra fascinating story because you were literally on the first episode ever. And I think technically got the first deal ever. So, I mean, these sharks, like, were, they were well-known business people, but they weren't, you know, like sharks, like, uh, you know, bold, underlined, italicized sharks that they are now, like mega celebrities. Uh, what, what? So what did you know about these specific sharks uh, before you started filming? I only knew what they gave me on a piece of paper. So they basically handed me uh, five sheets of paper and said, these are the investors you're going in to meet with. And so I had 30 minutes to read over their sheets. I had no idea who any of the five were. They were all moguls in their own industry, like Barbara, who is my was my investor. She was big in real estate. You know, everyone knew her in that industry, but I didn't know who any of the five were. And so I just kind of went in blindly and handed them my homemade clay prototypes. <laughs> the best kind of prototypes. The show and entrepreneurship have, of course, you know, changed plenty since since that initial show. But you know, besides these sharks becoming larger than life sharks over time. How has uh, Shark Tank changed overall, you think, since that filming? Oh, it's changed a lot. The due diligence process alone is completely different. So <clears throat> when I was on the pilot episode, Barbara had not ever invested, I don't believe, in, in a single product. So she was all real estate. So she and I were kind of learning the industry together and figuring it out as we went. And I was one of her only investments, you know, that first season because it, they filmed the pilot. Then there was a big gap between the pilot and actually filming the season once it got picked up. So yeah, it was just she, I, me, her, and then uh, maybe two other people. I don't even think she had two other people, maybe one. So I got all of this attention from her, all of this one-on-one -on -one mentoring, all of these things that people now do not necessarily get. Whereas now she has, you know, hundreds of, of companies she's invested in and she still does entrepreneur events and does, you know, a lot more interaction with them than I think most sharks do, but it's just a lot different. She doesn't have that ability to connect in that way with everyone and nor should she really. I think she probably learned some lessons along the way that she was an investor, not a friend, you know, and so she has to um, step back and be more like an, a typical investor is, whereas I had a little bit different relationship with her. Yeah, that's such a benefit of of being early on. Is you know, you're you're a real innovator in the uh, getting invested in by shark space, you know. <laughs> but I've always wondered that over time with 
with the sharks is like how in the world you know as the show keeps going on like one how do they have the money to keep investing in so many different products but two like you know they can't like clone themselves and have multiple more and more time that can that can actually maybe in a few years you can clone yourself who knows but like you can't just give out your time <laughs> like that like you know it's like a thing that dwindles over time so it's it's, it's awesome that you got an early exactly if, if you were gonna go on now like if you're gonna do that first episode over again is there anything you would have done different no not with my first product I was as honest as I could be on that first episode and like I said I went in with clay prototypes for god's sake so it was like as raw and real as it could be like this is my idea this is how early on this idea is now if I'd go on now with my newest product if I were to go on again then obviously I would do things a lot differently. I would know my numbers and that kind of stuff, but I didn't have anything on that first episode to share. So it was, um, all I have is my experience in, in the industry or in, in my experience with working with individuals with special needs and children. I didn't have any business knowledge. As a matter of fact, I kind of went in, I was a little bit naive about even starting a business. I think when she invested, it was kind of like, oh, wow. We went home and it was like, okay, now I have a business. I have to actually do all of this behind the scenes stuff of, of launching a company. And that was quite brutal for me as a creative person. So let's get to business. I, I totally thought of that on my own. You, you didn't tee me off at all on that. But <laughs> so, so a couple of awesome businesses that, and I know you've, you, you know, you do more than even this. So if we want to expand this for four hours, we'd have to, but Ava the Elephant is your beautiful and super cute and super helpful uh, invention that appeared on that Shark Tank episode. So let, let's start with uh, our friend Ava. So you, you hinted at it a little bit, but where did the um, the start of this idea that would eventually become the beloved, um, you know, clay prototype, <laughs> where did Ava come from in the first place? <laughs> so it came from me working with a little boy named Gibby, who I'm actually still uh, very close to. He's He's now a teen taller than I am, but I was working with him as his caregiver and he had a difficult time taking medication. I loved him dearly. He was my baby before I had children. I have four kids now. I didn't have any at the time. And I watched him struggle with medication. I mean, just simple things like Tylenol, we would have to restrain him because he had this fear of a medicine syringe or a dropper. And so <clears throat> one night I went home and I just had kind of this light bulb moment of why are we using the syringe that he's so scared of? Why can't I hide it? Why can't I make it more, you know, attractive to children? And so I made this little um, elephant out of fabric and sponges and the insides of a recordable greeting card and put a little voice on it. And it worked. The next day I took it to work and I used it on him and it worked like a charm. I mean, it was like something clicked in his little brain and he just took his medication. And so I also at that moment did not think anything about a business or an invention. It was more of just helping him. And then after we used it for a month, it started to really drive home with me that, look, there's a lot of kids that struggle with medication, not just children with special needs. And so a friend actually sent me a Craigslist ad of all things. I always joke that you don't always get murdered on Craigslist ads. That's what got me to submit for Shark Tank before it was Shark Tank. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So Shark Tank started on Craigslist, essentially? It did. <laughs> It did. You know, it was on everything, every newspaper, whatever, the casting for it because it was brand new. And um, social media was, God, I want to say it was the MySpace years. I don't I don't remember when Facebook came out, but it was slow or small at that time. And so, yeah, I, she saw an ad. It said, do you have the next million dollar idea? She knew about Gibby. She knew about Ava, which wasn't named at the time, but she knew about this idea I had and sent it to me. And I, I submitted and sent in a video, which was, I think, a VHS tape at the time. <laughs> <laughs> or a little tape or whatever. I sent a DVD or something over to them and I heard back within the week. That's like the old school uh, auditioning for Survivor. It's the same approach. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> How did you think of the name Ava? Oh, God. That's a really funny story, actually. <laughs> so it was Emmy the Elephant originally, or God, I can't even remember now. I think it was Ellie the Elephant, actually. And we have lots of Emmys in our life. My wife, Dana, is a uh, cousin and oh. like bestie and maid of honor's <laughs> name is emmy so that would uh, oh, you know that would okay, be our vote yeah. if you ever bring it to life again <laughs> right <laughs> it was ellie the elephant and what happened was i went to the pilot episode of shark tank i'm sitting there with about 40 attorneys around a table because again it was much different then they're just getting the show off the ground so they're like cobbling everything together as the as we go and so every entrepreneur that comes in they're checking their stuff right then all of them are searching trademarks 
to see what I can use because I don't even have a name for this product. They said no to Emmy. They said no to Ellie. They said no to all these things. And then we landed on Ava because I wanted something short and sweet. It was short and three letters and um, it wasn't taken, you know, with with elephant. And so I was like, okay, Ava the elephant. And it ended up becoming that, but it wasn't that on the episode. I, I had already pitched. I can't remember how the order of it, but I had already pitched basically Ellie. So you'll see that at the bottom of my, I think they okayed Ellie, but then Ellie ended up not being available after or something like that. So yeah, it wasn't any kind of heartfelt backstory or anything. It was just a trademarking thing. I think that's... Uh, important important lesson for anything is that it's got to make sense from a legal standpoint in order to actually do it. But it's it's funny. It's like, it's quite the image of you and forty lawyers trying to go through uh, right. <laughs> baby elephant names. <laughs> yeah, not even thinking about the name of the product, you know, which is all I do now is branding stuff. Or you know, I'm so into that part of it. But yeah, at the time it was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what the name's going to be or what the legal side was. So you you know joked that that part wasn't heartfelt, but you know, when you look at the story overall, it's, it's very heartfelt and it's a strong mission behind it. And something so many people can relate to, how did you get yourself to, you know, really just like be you, be yourself and, you know, effectively tell that story when, when you're, uh, you know, de- debut pitching to these sharks? That was where I was happy. Business is not my thing. It's still not even this many years later. I don't like the business side of things. I don't, mean all of the business side, but the bookkeeping and the numbers and the things that I have always struggled with my entire life. So for me, it was the heart of the business, which was Gibby, which was the children I was making this for. I would get little reminders, you know, as I started to build my business, I actually was diagnosed with cancer shortly after um, my pitch. So I went home, I started building my business um, I was kind of in the depths of figuring it all out, like how to register this as an FDA device and like all of these things that I didn't see coming. And I was diagnosed with cancer with a baby at home because I had my first baby shortly after. It was those messages from people who had my product because it had started shipping prior to you know Shark Tank airing. And mom saying, you know, my child had a liver transplant and she won't take her, you know, 42 medications a day unless it, she has this elephant. And Knowing I was making a difference is what has always really kept me in the game. And it's the same way now. It's the same way with my current brands. For me, that's what really feeds my soul and keeps me up is not so much the money side or the fame of Shark Tank or any of that, but more of like the private messages of, you know, the impact that I've had. That's so nice. I mean, I can only imagine like how much it means to you to hear, you know, read real feedback from customers and, and stories like that. Um, and it, yes. it, it, it puts it in a totally different it's like a totally different planet uh, when it's like, you, you, yeah. yeah, exactly. When you, when you realize how much this is impacting people's lives versus just like, you know, trying to come up with the product. We think about that Trying way. to sell more gadgets. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Shout out inspector gadget. But <laughs> <laughs> you worked out a, a licensing deal initially for, for Ava. Uh, if you're to flash forward, what kind of like in the lifespan of Ava, what, what were some of the biggest moments that worked well? So what happened was I launched the product, I ran the company, the day-to-day of the company, and Barbara was an investor for seven years. So we stayed a single SKU product in the in the business for seven years, which is a miracle in itself. And you have to know really about this industry to know how difficult that is. But we got to a point where I was just exhausted because you have a, a single SKU product, meaning you don't have a lot of space on the shelf at stores. You don't have a huge margin. It was only a 9 to $12 product at its highest price. And I knew I wanted to be creative again. And I knew I wanted to work with children or adults with disabilities again. And so I had the opportunity to license the product. And so I licensed it about seven years in. That's when Barbara stopped investing because, you know, we licensed the product. And so she got money. I got money. And then about four years after that, which was just a few years ago, I, we sold the entire product. So we sold the patent, we sold, you know, the trademark, everything that the company was acquired. And so those were kind of the big moments of, um, you know, victory on, on a, from a financial standpoint. But um, like I said, the, the bigger moments for me were things like when I, the company was acquired a few years ago, one of my standing points was I want to have more inclusive packaging. So I had met with someone on their team at this new company and she talked about, um, you know, what if you have someone with, with Down syndrome on the new package? And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be a dream come true for me. That's where it all started for me. And so we made that happen and things like that. That was my real payday. You know, seeing him on that package now um, today is the real exciting part to me because it's including people that I love so dearly, you know. 
Yeah, yeah, so that's awesome. What would you say was the most challenging part of the the overall journey with with Ava? Um, for me, it was not knowing the industry enough when I first went in, and it's not really an industry you can know with a college degree. I mean, it's product development and distribution is its own beast, and it changes for every single product. So it's different for cut and sew products. So if you have apparel, it's a whole different margin and monster. If you have plastics products like I had, you know, where I was creating something for a baby, it's a whole different. So it's changing for every single product you see on the shelf. It's a whole different um, journey and challenge. And so I just had to learn it as I went. So all of it was very difficult, you know, from day one up into seven years when I licensed, it was all very, very challenging because it was new challenges every day. If I was shipping it in from overseas, you know, I had challenges with that. Or I thank God I never had any legal challenges. We never harmed anyone. We never had well, any It's kind because of... cause you picked the name that was legal safe. That's why. <laughs> but the product itself, you know, even as a medicine dispenser, I always had nightmares about like, you know, what if, you know, mom gives too much medicine or, you know, something. So I didn't have that challenge, thank God. But um yeah, I mean it was it was all challenging. And it's one reason why I looked at the new new company I've launched the way that I did is my thoughts with Ava was, okay, I learned so much from this product, the margins on this product, the way that this product was sold, the niche market that it was a part of. And now I know that I will never go down that road again as a single SKU product. I would have to have a whole different company set up to do this again. And that's what led me to my new brand. You could not have teed that off better. It, it's like exactly, <laughs> it, and, and this has happened uh, with multiple guys, multiple Shark Tank albums. It's like I literally am at the point of my notes where I'm ready to get to the next part, and it's like the perfect sentence that leads <laughs> into it. So I don't I don't know how you have like x-ray vision to see my notepad, but thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get to OPU. So OPU Probiotics, your yes. latest business. Super cool. Uh, our, our friend, uh, yeah, our friend, Kevin from Create a Castle described it at first as adult pixie sticks, which I don't know if legally, <laughs> legally you're going that route, but it does help to visualize it. Yeah. Um, right. But at the time of this recording, you, are, you have multiple SKUs. You got mint, you got mocha. Obviously, you know, there's an emphasis on health and gut health, and there's a lot of be- benefits to it. But for, so- for someone like me who I've heard the term probiotic, but I still don't know quite exactly what it does. What, for starters, like what is a probiotic? Yeah, that's a great question. I think so many people are confused by probiotics, especially men. And I hate to. Yeah, no, no, I'm 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 an example of this. <laughs> no, but I'll go to events and I'll be standing out at events giving out samples, and I'll have men literally stop and go, "Oh, no, no, no!" And they'll put their hand out and kind of like block, you know, the sample, and they'll say, "I'm watching football later. I don't want to be in the bathroom all day." And they think something about me, and I've heard that countless times from only men. And I think it's because because they think it's a laxative or a stool softener or something that it is not. So probiotics are good bacteria. So basically your gut has good and bad bacteria at all times going down through your intestines. And you need more good than bad. And when people are susceptible to stomach viruses and the flu and all sorts of things, it's because they may have more bad bacteria in their gut. And as things go down through, again, they're more susceptible to those things. Maybe it's diarrhea or... Um, if you don't have enough good bacteria, you can also have constipation. We're going to talk about a lot of uncomfortable things on the show. <laughs> so these are good bacteria you're basically introducing to your gut so that they can multiply and make it a healthier place. So your gut is now full of great bacteria, and then you have a small amount of bad bacteria that might be introduced. The perfect example is when you go to Mexico or you go to somewhere and you end up picking up these things that you pick up. If you are taking a probiotic, you may not get so many of those things because your your gut is healthy. The same with food poisoning. Um, the one great example for me, and I always share this is, or I've shared it lately, my family and I just went to Disney during Christmas. So in f- cold and flu season, we were there. We're a family of six, four kids. Three of the four are very young and none of us got sick and we're on a daily probiotic. And I contribute that to the product because we're not on other vitamins. We're just on a daily probiotic. So that's what a probiotic is. It basically goes in and makes your gut healthy. A prebiotic, which we also have in our blend, is food for the probiotic. So those little bugs that you're putting in, the healthy bacteria that you're putting in, the prebiotic is essentially feeding them. So will it will it make me use the bathroom? All- no, I'm just kidding. 
it will make you regular. So that's the one thing that will happen <laughs> that's, is if, that's good. if people I need don't that. go but every three days. Yeah. No, and everyone needs that. If people yeah. think it's normal to go to the restroom every three or four days, it's not. It's not healthy. It's not normal. So it will make you regular as in you will go once a day and you'll go, wow, didn't know I should be doing that. You know, um, so that's yes, a great, it will be I, that, but it will not be like an urgent thing. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Who can't get behind that? No, I appreciate the background on, on all of it. And yeah, there's, there's lots of benefits to it. And I, I think that like, I'm definitely, you know, in addition to your brand, like I've been hearing the term probiotic like more and more in recent yeah. years. Like I think it's something that more and more people are are converting their attention to. Uh, on your front, how did you start to want to maybe start a business one day in this probiotic space? What I really love about this company is that it came to me the exact same way that Ava did through real life experiences. So through an elephant. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I I didn't set out to start another business. I um Ava was acquired. I had some breathing room and uh I looked back at my journey and I had so when I had cancer, I had a radiation that was so strong that I had to ingest it. So um it was a little pill that I'd go in and I'd open this vial that looked like something off of a sci-fi film. It literally had the radiation stamp on it. And so I'd open this giant metal vial in a room by myself with gloves on. And I would pull this pill out and they would tell me not to touch this pill, but I was supposed to eat it. Okay. So that's how strong it was. And once I ingested it, I would have to go be isolated for seven days at a time. So whenever I had this radiation treatment, I would have to be isolated from anything living, including my dog, you know, plants, obviously, but any animal, people, whatever I had to be away from. And so, uh, cause it was radiating off of me and it would also come out in the toilet and whatnot. So as you can imagine, that uh, wreaked havoc on my digestion. So I started looking, whenever I had these treatments, I started looking at how do I improve my digestion? How do I help my stomach? You know, my, at the time I didn't even know it was intestines, but you know, my digestion basically. And so I started taking different probiotics. I didn't really see a difference in a lot of them. And then I found one specific strain that had a really great effect on me. It helped me. It was called Bacillus subtilis. And I just am the kind of learner that learns by doing like I did with Ava. And so I became fascinated with this one brand that is now my competitor, oddly, and loved the effect that it had on me and how great it made me feel and all the things it did. And I started learning more about Bacillus subtilis and why it was better than the others. I kept taking this competitor, now competitor's brand for probably two years I took it. And it wasn't until I sold Ava that I thought, I really hate the way I have to take this person's product. It was a powder. It was a chalky powder that I had to pour into milk every morning. And then I'd like stir it up and then chug the milk and half of it was in the bottom of the cup. And it wasn't dissolvable. It just went into the whatever liquid it was. And you had to try to drink it all. Knowing what I knew about product development from Ava, I decided to set out and see if I could find a factory to work on a different delivery method. And so I found a factory in my own home state of Georgia and sat down with them and said, what are my options? You know, and we basically started this development almost three years ago now. And then last year we launched Opu. So Opu has mint and mocha flavors right now, but we're going to have a whole slew of uh, flavors in the future. And a whole slew of skews. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, you, yeah. you learned to have more than one skew. <laughs> well, the main thing that we do differently too with Opu is we're direct to consumer. So we make our product here in Georgia. We make our packaging here in Georgia. So these are two things that I could not do with Ava. I tried for many years to make Ava in the United States and I wasn't able to at a price that would work. And so we're shipping this product right to my facility here in Georgia, like a truckload away. And then we're shipping it direct to consumer. So I'm not in any retailers yet. With Ava, it was like retailer, 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 and all the nightmares that came with it. Right now I'm taking it slowly and I'm staying direct to consumer and it's been a dream I get to see every single thing from the back end of my Shopify store and know exactly what's going on with my brand and control every aspect of it. So it's it's like the opposite of my first company, basically. It's been wonderful. You could even say it's the opposite. <laughs> I, I, th that was the point of this whole interview was for that joke. <laughs> Where, what does the name Opu mean, That's by good. the way? So Opu means stomach in um, Hawaiian, actually, tummy oh. or stomach. And it doesn't have a direct, I don't think it's directly linked to the intestines, but it, I was looking for all of these names for months. We went through, a, I mean, probably a hundred names and the fact that it was three letters and it had such a ring to it. I loved it that it was three again, like Ava, but the fact that it has meaning in that, in the Hawaiian language was really cool. 
But yeah, it means stomach or tummy. Isn't that cool? And what I really loved about it is, you know, Squatty Potty from Shark Tank? Yeah, yeah, of course. Squatty Potty does all these funny commercials and whatnot. When we really establish our brand, when we're more established and trusted, because we have to do that as a consumable, you can't go out with these hard jokes at first. They're going to not <laughs> take us seriously, you know? I want to play more off of that name. We want to do more silly, oh, uh, you know, social media videos and whatnot. Yeah, so. and, and think of that, you know, the, the second like the suffix of it yeah, but yeah perfect <laughs> <laughs> right so you mentioned that opu and well, now i can't think of it different way thanks uh opu and ava the elephant this is almost like opposite or opposite businesses and there's so much different about it you know whether you look at retailers or licensing and your sh- shopify like that has to be so amazing to have all that data at your fingertips what would you say has changed between these businesses in terms of how you as, you know, an entrepreneur and leader operate like in the day to day? Um, well, everything, you know, being in a different climate with having Shopify and all of that at my fingertips, that's changed. You know, when I started Ava, we had a website developer that I could never reach. And then, you know, we'd have re airs or we'd have, they'd come and film follow-ups with me and our website would crash and it was just a nightmare. So in that 10 to 12 year span, I mean, everything has changed. You know, now I have, like you said, everything right at my fingertips. I can run my entire company from my house. We obviously have a facility that we, that we ship product from, but the majority of it I do from home. And it's just, I looked at everything when I started this company from a business standpoint now, because it was like, okay, the margins are fantastic. I can do this. I can discount with Ava. I couldn't do any of that. You know, if it was a nine ninety nine product at CVS and we offered a coupon, it was like, ooh, there goes another seventy five cents of our, you know, <laughs> very small profit. If I made two dollars on each one, I was lucky. And so, that does not allow a business owner to do any of the things they need to do. The marketing, most importantly, that they need to do. And so, this one I was able to see from kind of an eagle's eye view or whatever they call it from the start of okay, wow, I'm going to have the margins. I'm going to be direct to consumer. I'm, going to make everything here in Georgia. So, you know, I'm not going to have issues with it getting caught up at the port or timelines or any of that. It's all right here. So it's been a much easier journey. That's for sure. But I mean, still challenging because you're running the day to day of your business, but not like Ava. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get to segment of inspiration, creativity. I mean, typically it's about, you know, what you do outside of work and creative hobbies and how you come up with ideas, things like that. But a uh, slightly different tone for this one. You, know, you mentioned that you're a cancer survivor and, you know, it actually overlaps a bit with, you know, your latest business, obviously. In terms of, you know, your experience with cancer and treatment and, and everything, in, which I still can't believe that, you know, when you think about entrepreneurs that are like having kids at the same time, like that's already like a new business and a new kid is like enough on mm-hmm. your plate. And then for you, it's like you throw this cancer experience on top of everything. It's like, it, it, it's a ama- just amazing what you've been able to do. So, well, for, first of all, if you don't mind, what, what type of cancer was it? It was papillary carcinoma. So it was in my thyroid, but then it had spread to my um, neck and th- and uh, lymph nodes on the side of my neck. So got it. Okay. And how how long after that Shark Tank recording did you first hear the news that you, you had this? Um, that was the craziest part. Is I filmed my show in maybe. December, January, I heard just a few months later, like I said, in the thick of building my business. So it was kind of like we were filing the company, we were filing with the FDA, we were literally finding our factory and doing all this stuff of designing Ava and everything I had to do for my company was happening when I heard this diagnosis. And then I, the battle went for about three and a half years before I heard I was cancer free. So really in the thick of everything. All the hardest parts of my company was when I was battling cancer. My treatments were a little bit different. They were kind of spread out in a weird way. So for those three and a half years, I would have to have them, have scans, have another radiation, have scans, have another radiation. Wasn't like how you think about chemo now where people go in for 12 treatments, thank God. It was a lot less than some people go through, but but it was obviously terrible and very difficult. Yeah. Uh overall how would you say that that experience like impacted you know everything else in your life like your family your your businesses like you know everything it made me want to throw in the towel that's for sure there were so many times I wanted to quit but I'm so grateful that I didn't because I wouldn't be where I am now you know I wouldn't have the company I have now I wouldn't 
even have what I have from Ava. I mean, she's still out there. She's as part of another company. She's blessing other kids. So it was challenging and it, it tried me to my ends, to the, you know, ends of the earth, but it is, I wouldn't take it back. I, I'm very grateful for the experience I had from cancer. It definitely put things into perspective for me. I treat life differently. I do not let my business even now take over my life or take over the time with my kids. I'm very good about separating the two. Um, but I, again, I'm used to working while they run around me in circles. So I guess that's kind of <laughs> just my normal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That's all I know. To this day, is there something that it's just kind of like in your heart, it's like truly changed um, your perspective, your outlook on things? You know, I think a lot of people focus on my cancer because cancer is so terrible and it was for me as well. But for me, I've had harder things happen. I am, um, believe it or not, I had my mother struggled with a autoimmune liver disease. So it means basically your body is attacking your liver. My mom never drank. She was um, someone who stayed away from alcohol her whole life, ironically, but then died of her liver failing. And it was because of this autoimmune disease where her body was attacking it. And that was the hardest thing for me. And that happened about three and a half years ago. And it really, truly put everything into perspective because this is someone who, you know, went to school, got five different degrees, did all these things she fought so hard for and could not win for anything. So I just try to stay really grateful that I'm here, that I'm still here with my kids, that I, you know, I, I look back all the time at that first period where I cried and thought, I'm not going to see my little girl at the time, my first daughter go to kindergarten and have her first crush. I kept thinking about that. Like, I'm not going to see her have a crush on a little boy. And I, and now she's 14 and I have three other kids and like have lived, I literally feel like I've, I've lived four different lifetimes, you know, through Ava, through all the experiences Ava and Shark Tank have given me through my new business. So I just try to stay grateful for all of it, that I'm still here to, to live this wonderful adventure. Well, we're so glad that you didn't throw in the towel and it, it, I appreciate you sharing all that. Like, I know it's not the easiest thing to talk about or, yeah. or, or relive, but, um, you know, people say it's life changing and certainly is for you. And, and now you have four lives out of it, as you said, <laughs> so yep. different That's lifetimes it. and chapters. Let's get this is this one is like the opposite of last time because there's there's no, there's no good segue to, this is just a hard cut you know cold turkey and we're gonna get to um much lighter notes so <laughs> let's do it the unusual pet peeves quirks weird talents let's start with weird talents oh boy i don't really have any weird talents uh, I think the only thing I can do is pick things up with my toes. Like I don't really have any. That talent. is perfect. Yeah, that's the weirdest of all I've ever heard. No, but that no, that's really good. You do you do that frequently? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if something's on the ground, I'll grab it with my first two toes. But yeah, I don't really have any. Ta I always think about that. Like talent shows, I'm out of luck. I, I can't sing. I can't dance. I have two left feet. Like nope, you, nothing here. You have here. two left feet, and you <laughs> pick up stuff all the time with both of those left feet. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a good talent with kids. Like, I mean, I have a way with children that no other people have. So I consider that a talent. It's not really something you can show off, but I have a way with children. You show it off. You deserve it. How about pet peeves? What's something that just, it might be like a minor thing in the grand scheme of things, but it just annoys you a little bit. You know, mine all come back to business now because I do get approached by so many inventors and business owners now. And my thing is, I am always okay with someone reaching out with a direct question when they respect your time and they say, I need help with this. I'm always game. And I try to answer it right away. Like if I know I'll, I'll write them a you know, two page essay about it. But when people reach out and they want you to do things for you, for them, that's my pet peeve. I hope, and I hope I can encourage other people hearing this, if they're Shark Tank fans and they're going to reach out to other Shark Tank entrepreneurs, that they will remember that these people have their lives and their businesses to run. So many of us are very generous with our time and we want to share what we've learned, but make it easy on the person. That's my pet peeve. Try to make it as easy as the person that you're reaching out to as you possibly can. Here are my three questions. No, we can't meet you for coffee. No, we can't go hang out, but we could, we could help you tremendously if you just reach out and are super forward with the things you need the most help with. If it's a, a reference for a factory or if it's a whatever it is, even if we tell you we can't give you that, like I'd much rather someone reach out and be direct. The more and more exposed to the business world and different, you know, e email communication with people, it's like I don't know anybody who likes wasting time. You know, it's like it's like the more short and to the point, and just being clear, especially when it's, you know, w what's your ask? I think is a huge, 
hugely help- yes. helpful. Yes, what's your ass? That's a good way to put it. I also think that uh, I just want to apologize to you because your your time is. Uh, I'm sure you're very busy and you're just wasting it away on this interview. So I, I don't know what you were Shut thinking, up. but no. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> and then uh, quirks. What's something a little quirky <laughs> about your personality that maybe your kids or friends, family, somebody calls you oh, out for, but it's God. who you are. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's not quirky at all. I don't, I don't think it's quirky, but I do want people to know that I've always struggled learning. I always try to share that a lot on LinkedIn because people see me and they have a, um, when they see me visually, they always assume that I have everything together. And my life is quite the opposite. I've always really, really struggled in school. My entire life I struggled in school. I just barely graduated high school. I mean, I had to take extra classes in the summer to get my degree, didn't get to walk with my class. And I'm still the exact same way when it comes to learning in a traditional manner. I cannot sit. I will not, like I couldn't go to college if you paid me a million dollars. I couldn't do it. It's not really a quirky thing, but it's just something I think it's always nice to share because I, people have perceptions of others and they see them and they think they have it all together. And that's not me. I am a creative person. I do really well on that side and I can learn all sorts of things in my own way. And I have, and I continue to, but I cannot learn easily in a traditional way. So I hope that encourages somebody. I think it will. And and let's learn a little bit more about you. Let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q and A. You ready for it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get wild. You are a mom of four, as you mentioned, which is not the easiest thing in the world. (laughs) It doesn't have the easiest reputation in the world, but obviously very heartfelt. Got to love it. What advice would you have for other mothers or new mothers out there? That's a good one. I love this one. Um, so I would tell them to just let their kids grow as they as they do. Uh, so many new moms freak out about everything. They're not stepping. They're not walking yet. They're not eating this food yet. They're not developing at the right pace. All of my children I've let just develop as they do, and they'll do it at different times, and they'll do it at different ages. The perfect example, and I think I see this because I did have learning disabilities, so I understood this from a different perspective. So I was always really chill with my kids on that stuff. But I remember when my oldest daughter, who's 14 now and and speaks perfectly, I mean, she just is so eloquent and um, is well-spoken. She was about four or five years old and the doctor and my mom were both like, I think she needs to go to speech therapy. I don't think she's going to get it. Oh, and they were freaking out. And I was like, no, she's fine. She'll get there. She was just very shy. And sure enough, she did. And she was fine. She worked out all these cute little quirky things she said I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for that. Definitely, you know, if a doctor persists, then pursue it. But don't freak out about your kid growing at a certain um, rate, you know, at at whatever it might be. Just let them grow and they'll do it at different times. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And I think, you know, if we think about each of our own lives, like how many skills or traits, hobbies, like how much changed in our own lives when we think back to that, like maybe changed in college or maybe changed when we were 30 or older, you know, it's like, yes, it's real. you know, some stuff just might might happen at different times. A doctor said the most profound thing to me one time. He said, I went in for, in my, the middle of growing my business, actually, I went in and I said, I think I need medication for my, my learning challenges and, or maybe even ADHD. I didn't know what it was. And he said, if your parents had put this on you when you were younger, given this to you when you were younger, you would not be where you are now. Do you, are you sure you want to do this? And I stopped and I said, no, and I didn't. And I'm so glad I did not because I started to change the whole perspective of just learning differently and being okay with that. So don't put so much pressure on your kids that they have to learn a certain way. Absolutely. Just chills and inspired and Tiffany got me. Tiffany, thank you so much for all you do, your amazing story, uh, business, personal life, all things in between and outside and around. And and thank you, wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. Uh, if you want to connect with Tiffany, you can learn more at tiffanycrewmans.com, avatheelephant.com, as well as opuprobiotics.com, and of course, on social media at Tiffany Crewmans. As always, I really, 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 really appreciate you tuning in to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. And if you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to follow the Wild Business Growth Podcast on your favorite app and tell a friend about the podcast. And then uh, try you know, picking things up with your toes uh, with your friends. Uh, you know, why not? <laughs> you can also find us on Good Pods where there are fantastic podcast people and recommendations. 
And for any help with podcast production, you can learn more at maxpodcasting.com and sign up for the Podcasting to the Max newsletter. That is at maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!